Welcome to the Resilient Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Doug Kachijan, and today I'm joined by Jared Bullock. Jared is a former U.S. Army Green Beret, an owner and strength and conditioning coach at Foundry Athletics. In 2013, while deployed to Afghanistan, Jared sustained serious injuries when his vehicle hit a roadside bomb. Despite losing two limbs during the incident, Jared has since competed in bodybuilding and adventure racing and founded his own training facility. Jared embodies the motto, strength through adversity. We discuss his special forces career and rehabilitation from the blast injury Jared sustained in Afghanistan. Jared also talks about the strength coaches who mentored him during his transition into a civilian career. It was a nice reminder that there are some truly generous and giving people in the field. I highly encourage you to reference the links in the show notes to learn more about Jared's facility and the physical training he continues to do on his own. Hey, Jared, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. You've got a really cool journey from um, Army Special Forces operator to strength coach. So we kind of have an overlap here from both those types of audiences, like, you know, tactical and the performance um, disciplines. I guess, would you mind starting just by talking about what made you decide to, you know, go into the Army? And like, was that, did you have a career before that? Or did you go right from high school or college into the Army? And did you know you wanted to do special forces or did you kind of cross train from a different, um, a different MOS or job in the army? So I originally attended college, um, for a year and I, I grew up with four brothers and one of those being a twin, um, he ended up being like, Hey, I want to go join the military. And I'm like, okay, you know, like I'll go with you. Cause like we were, we grew up in a very small town, small area. And after being there for so long, you're kind of like, let me go see what's going on in the world. And so, when I signed up, I initially signed up for the um, 18 x-ray program, which was to go in pipeline for SF. <clears throat> and then when I was in basic um, and get into the, the prep course for SF, you know, I'm 18 years, like 18, 19 years old. And I got all these guys in there with me that are like 24. And they're like, oh, hey, man, I've been backpacking around Europe. You know, like they've lived these like really full lives. And I'm like, All right, I'm, the, I'm this 19 year old kid that's like, I flew to Florida like one time. Like I wasn't mature, like I grew up on a farm and that's all I knew. Yeah. And so I kind of made that decision right there. Like I went to the cadre and was like, you know what? I need to go do a regular army time first so I can, I can learn and then come back. And they're like, okay, you know, we respect that. So I went and um, I did six years in the, uh, the regular army serving as a, in the infantry Oh, cool. Uh, with a few deployments to the Middle East. <clears throat> and then, you know, made that decision like, okay, I'm ready. All right, so went back, passed selection, and then, you know, spent my time in seventh group, you know, at Bragg and, and when they moved to Eglin, um, you know, doing counter narcotic stuff down in South America. Um, and then I had one trip to uh, Afghanistan um, <clears throat> in Panjaway where I got injured. Yeah, and we'll definitely, we'll get to that. So that's interesting. So at what, at what point, how, how deep were you into that um, the special forces pipeline before you decided that you wanted to actually go into the conventional army and, and kind of just grow as an infantryman, which is obviously like ultimately a very mature thing that you did. How much did you have invested before you did that? So I had already went through, you know, basic and AIT okay. um, airborne school. And I was a couple of months in to the, uh, the special operations preparations course. Um, and then I just, then I knew I was like, like I said, like everybody was older, more mature, had a lot more world experience than I did. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not ready. So okay. I pretty much had, you know, like my minimal time and then a few months in that prep course. Yeah. And then, I mean, for the people who don't know like what the job of, you know, army special forces uh, personnel is, can you just speak to, you know, kind of like what your main, the main responsibilities are? Cause I think some people when they hear special forces, they kind of associate that with like special operations and every, you know, every branch, including like army, Navy, air force and special forces and special operations are two different things, which I'm sure like that probably frustrates you because they tend to be, you know, like equated. So what was kind of, the, what, what drew you to that particular job? Because it's actually like fundamentally a lot different than like being a seal or a ranger or even like some of the air force jobs. I mean, honestly, part of it, like from the beginning, <clears throat> cause I'm old, like I'm 37 now um black hawk down which is an awesome movie yep. you know like watching watching the guys from cag 
um, and the Rangers in that movie, it was kind of like, you know what? Like, I want to do that. Like these guys, if you're going to do something, you're going to, I want to go all in, right? If I'm going to do it, I want to be the best. Um, and so that kind of led me to that path and it reinforced it. Like when I was in the regular army and I, and it sounds super cliche, but I was at one of the bases and this guy walks in, he's got a beard, you know, no patches on. And he just walks in and he's like, Hey, I'm looking for major so-and-so. And he's like, well, I'm, you know, I'm so-and-so you can just talk to me. And he's like, well, I'm not fucking here to talk to you. And I'm just like, that seals it. You know what I mean? Like that seals it for me. Like I, I have to go there, like just the maturity level. And we can get onto that, like how that made me, like I learned a lot being in the regular army, but what I learned, like being special forces, like I probably grew up a lot faster. Like it forced you to grow up and it made you have to make decisions on the spot and be an adult and, and live with those decisions. So. Okay. But it wasn't like you weren't particularly drawn necessarily like the unconventional warfare and training partner for forces versus like a job where it's explicitly a little bit more kind of confrontational. No, you know, it just, it looked cool when I was, okay. you know, when you're young, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, yeah totally. It looks cool. You know what I mean? You're like, you're the guy that has all the toys. You, you have the beard. That was it. Yeah. I'm sure your perspective probably changed a little bit, but a little bit. it all, it all I mean, works I got, out. I yeah. Negative to, to say about it by any means. I enjoyed it. So. All right. And then, so, I mean, we were talking a little bit off, off air and, you didn't have the strength and conditioning background or the coaching background before you went into the army. So what was kind of like the, um, what did the, the special forces pipeline like physically entail? And with the limited information of training that you had at the time, how did you prepare for that? So the, the pipeline in general, <clears throat> when I went through, um, you had to go to special forces assessment and selection, um, which was three weeks. <clears throat> so upon you being picked at the end of that, um, that started the qualification course, which was where you ended up upon graduation, you would get your tab and your beret. Um, <clears throat> so when I went through after selection, it started with, I, I had to learn Spanish for my primary language. So three months, five hours a day, except for weekends, sitting in a classroom, uh, learning Spanish. And then with that time, you also had to do PT on the side. So the physical training aspect, was to prepare you for when we do small unit tactics, which is about a month or two, I would say. I can't exactly remember. Um, so from there, you go to small unit tactics. Um, upon completion of that, you'll go to SEER school, which we all have to go through like level C, uh, which is like a month or so. Um, after that, you will do your military occupation specialty. So for me, I was a comms guy. That was three months um, working on that. And then it, you have a culmination exercise, which is Robin Sage, which is <clears throat> a month or so where basically you take everything you learned. Um, the cadre are kind of there, but they're more hands off. And so basically you guys come together as a team and <clears throat> infiltrate a you know fake country and build up a guerrilla force and kind of do your part. Right. And so did you have a pretty good idea from being in the, in the conventional army and the infantry, what, what the requirements were, especially the physical requirements? Because I mean, some people, you know, like they, like to your point, they join those units because it looks cool, but a lot of times they don't know what it actually entails. And I know that it's less of an issue now because of like the internet and all the information that's available. Mm -hmm. But like, there are people, you know, who like joined pararescue when, when I went into the military who like literally like didn't know that it required like swimming and doing stuff underwater, which sounds insane, but I mean, if you show up, if you show up to that yeah. pool day one and you haven't prepared for that, like it's, it's already pretty hellacious. Um, it's, a lot, it's a lot more hellacious if you have no idea what's, what's coming. Like, did you have a pretty good idea of what you're going to be asked to do in terms of all the running and the rucking and sleep deprivation and that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, so, which was nice. Like when I, when I decided to go, um, you know, they have recruiters like special force recruiters. So going to them and talking to them, um, you know, obviously you have to meet the requirements like time and service, you know, ASVAB GT score. Those guys did a pretty good job of explaining, hey man, this is gonna be what's required of you, you know, to pass selection and stuff like that, you know, physically. So we worked on that stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then my regular army unit allowed me, you know, I would still come to, to normal work, but I would do PT in the mornings and stuff 
with the SF recruiters oh, to cool. kind of get me ready. So, which was nice because uh, I came from like a mech unit. So everybody's, no offense to anybody that's from a mech unit out there listening, like they're, 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 they're fucking lazy. Yeah. So, um, and I, you know, I didn't want to go down that path. So it worked out really good. Um, plus, you know, back in the day, you know, we still, you still had the internet, but like wasn't as big. So you could buy books on like, you know, special forces prep. Right. And it was like, you know, old school kind of like, Hey yeah. man, this is how you should tie your boots, like double laces, you know, where, you know, where, where your dress socks underneath, you know? So kind of the, the, the physical aspect. And as far as the mental side, it kind of had some preparation. Yeah. So, and I mean, it, like, I'm sure knowing what you know now, you probably would have prepared differently, but ultimately like if you're consistent and you run and you do a lot of calisthenics and you rock, it doesn't need to be perfect, especially when you're young enough. Like as long as you just do enough work, you'll be, you'll be ready to go. And just yeah. don't quit. You know what I mean? Like that's right. a lot of things, man. I, I going back to like you talking about guys not knowing how to swim, that would probably be a reason I would never be like a para rescue guy or a Navy SEAL. You know, I come from a landlocked state, you know, if you need me to swim to save my life, sure. But you know, a thousand meters, probably not. Um, but we had guys like that show up to selection and they're like, it just sounded cool. Like I didn't know, they didn't know what it was. They're like, right. I didn't realize I was going to have to, you know, rock an unknown distance or run an unknown time and you just go. And I'm like, well. Yeah. And this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I like asking people, especially with your background, because you have like the strength and conditioning background and you actually like were in the military in a special operations unit. You know, you see a lot of, um, a lot of like even professional and collegiate teams, like they have this infatuation with the military. And I think sometimes they take, you could say the right or the wrong things from the military, but a lot of times it's like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to do team building and we're going to have like these, you know, high level athletes, like running around with logs or crawl through the mud. And, and so I see you, you kind of rolling your eyes. That kind of tells me what you think about that. And, and now you're, you're coaching team sport athletes, right? So how much of a, of a, of a carryover or place do you see for, like taking a special operations sort of selection type program and then giving, giving like team sport athletes a, a miniaturized version of that. Like, what do you think is the, the carryover, if anything? And I'm trying, I'm doing the best that I can to not bias the question, but I can kind of tell already how you feel about that. Like, I, I think there's things that you can, you can take that transfer over, but I, I really think it comes down to like, for me with my kids, um, I have teenagers that don't have a lot of responsibility. So like, I like to give them responsibility and then they have to own that. You know what I mean? Like if we, if we mess something up or like, if you're, if you're tired and you're cutting reps, like, Hey man, we're going to have to talk. Like, I don't believe in, in yelling, you know, like when you were like, when I was in regular army, like everybody yelled and that was like the norm. Yeah. But then when I, you know, in special forces, it's like, I'm going to talk to you like a man. You know what I mean? Um, and, and I mean, I, as far as like team building go, stuff goes, I just, I just think that's like, if you're going to do it outside the military, it's more of like a culture thing, like build cohesiveness, but like do it in a fun way. Like, I, I don't want ever want kids to be like, yeah. well, if we suck, we're going to get punished and it's going to be team building. Like that's not going to make anybody want to do anything. You know what I mean? It's just going to drive them apart. And I don't No, no, I'm good with that. Yeah, no. And it's, it's, a lot of times, like, I think it depends on what the rationale is for it. But if, if, we're, if we're saying that, like, you know, if you're a football player and like, we make, we put you through like mini buds, like, I don't know, I'm pretty confident in saying it's not going to make you better at football. It's probably not going to make you more, you know, mentally tough is another kind of phrase where it's like, I don't know if that's going to make you in the fourth quarter of a game, less likely to jump off sides or to run the right route or to perform under pressure. You know, if you want to do it for like the novelty um, and you do it like responsibly, but I, I don't know if there's a huge like performance a direct performance benefit from it. And I think that there's things that people, you know, professional sports can take from the military in terms of like developing systems and accountability and like kind of more like just cultural type things. But I don't know if, you know, running around in the mud is necessarily like the first thing people should be taking. And I feel like it, yeah. it often there's is, no, you know, there's no ROI on that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what are you getting out of that? Like, if anything, maybe you wasted a training day, somebody got hurt or you know what I mean? Like now you've, over you know you over fatigue them so it carries over to the next day like what are you going to do then yeah so. then it detracts from like what you really want to do mm -hmm. um all right so then you you know you make it through uh special forces pipeline and then you know i i know that special forces can have a pretty varied mission set like everything from more like you know direct action type missions to 
building partner forces. You mentioned like the Robin Sage scenario of kind of like developing a, a guerrilla force. So, you know, in your, your deployments with SF, like what were the different mission taskings, obviously with respect for OPSEC and stuff that, you know, that, that you were, you, your team was responsible for? Um, like as far as South America goes, um, like counter narcotics, um, like joint combined exercise training. So we did some partner stuff with like Colombian special forces. Um, I work with the special forces out of Peru. Um, just kind of seeing how they worked and then, you know, they'd get new equipment in and then trying to working with them, getting them up to par for, you know, like at the time Peru, like the Sendero Luminosa was a big thing, like the big drug cartel. <clears throat> um, and then Afghanistan was pretty much just, hey man, you know, fighting terrorism. So, and right. then partnering up with, you know, you've obviously been over there trying to get, you know, whether it's Iraqi or Afghan special forces up to par for your job to be done, which we, we both know will never happen. But <laughs> yeah, you know, from a non-political <laughs> standpoint. No, well, you know what? It's, it's like, that's the thing is talking to people who are actually responsible for doing it so to hear someone like you say that, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people who have like, you know, a political dog in the fight, but you, like you actually did it. Um, and I, I always thought that like way too much was asked of a special forces, like the minimal resources you have. And you're basically like, you're responsible for taking these unmotivated people to, to secure parts of the world that like have never been secured before. Like, I think that it's actually like amazing that you guys achieved what you, what you did over there. Um, and, and just like, like I said, the minimal resources being out there in these remote areas with, you know, like oftentimes like really, really far from resupply. Whereas like, frankly, you know, like my job could be intense at times, but for 90% of it, you're sitting in a pretty safe place. You know, guys are watching movies, playing video games, you're training. And then when something happens, you go and do it. But like, I wasn't sleeping in the dirt every night, like you were. So, um, you know, much, much respect for that. But as far as like, um, you know, working with the partner forces, I mean, I think a lot of things, one of the things people don't get about special forces is that like, you're kind of like a teacher in a lot of ways. Um, and you're, you're, you know, you're training people who are often pretty incompetent and trying to get them to do some, um, you know, some pretty difficult things. How, how did like um, that experience, like help you to, to become a better coach? And I mean, did you guys even, I'm sure like part of your pipeline is you get training and like how to be a teacher, but was that like really a, a systematic thing or was it something where you just kind of learn on the fly? You really, you really less like learn. Um, so like when I got to my team, usually you have a senior. Mm -hmm. And then when I got there, he was, I got in there, you know, I met him and he's like, okay, by the way, like you're in charge now. Like I'm leaving to go to the SIF. And I'm like, like you, you, you were in charge. <laughs> yeah. Like you're yeah. in charge of your own section. Okay. And like you basically learned 10% of everything you need to know in the Q course. Like, there's all kinds of other equipment. You know what I mean? Like yeah. as an SF dude compared to the regular army as infantry, like everybody's doing everything else for you in the, in the regular army. Like when you're in, in special forces, like your deltas, like your medics, like they're in charge of like making sure your pay is good. You know, as a oh, really? dude, like you're getting all your crypto, like you're doing all the radios, like you're packing your own stuff. Like you're doing all the manifest, like you're in charge of everything. Like everybody, it looks really cool. Yeah. Like that you're, yeah, you're going to go out, like I said, you're going to wear, you're going to get beards, you're going to get cool toys and do stuff. That's literally 10% of it. 90% is like all the shit, pardon my language, that nobody sees yeah. that goes into it that people don't understand. And so, like I said, you have to grow up really fast. And then, you know, going to countries and instructing them in their own native language, you know, like I'm in charge of, you know, like I said, teaching, improving special forces, like hey man, this is how we're going to build antennas. This is how we're going to do this. It's in their native language. And then dealing with it, right. it allows you to kind of, to build like how you want to teach, right? Like how I'm going to go about that. Um, Cause like, you know, when you're taught your language, you're taught like very formal. And when you're dealing with those guys, you know, they're, they're not from the city. They're from the jungle. They, yeah. they deal in slang or they're, they're not well educated. So it, it transfers over with kids and it's like, okay, like these are my coaching cues that I would normally use. Okay, you, you don't understand like what I'm saying. How can I approach this in a better way or what kind of, you know, intrinsic feedback or can I give you and, and we, can, we can work together to get it done. So it carried yeah. over a lot of time. Totally, and I mean like what, 
what people don't get is like you yeah you went to the language school for spanish but you also went to countries where that wasn't the native language and so you're basically like teaching people oftentimes like from scratch through through an interpreter and you're teaching people like not only to do a very dangerous and important job but these people are like kind of keeping you alive too mm -hmm. so like i i i I think it's got to be the ultimate like teaching slash coaching experience, you know, like you, you've got language barriers, high pressure, high stakes, and um, like very minimal margin for error, you know? Yeah. Cause I mean, it's just you and 12 other guys, you know, with whatever partner force you have, you know, and then sometimes you get broken down into cells where it's just like two or three of you with those guys. And it's like, we have to be, we have to teach them right. So, you know, nobody's getting, shot in the back so. yeah and then, and then you mentioned like um your injury like how much of that do you even remember or like was it stuff where people like told you after the fact like here's what happened or do you remember vividly certain details of that if you're like you know if you're okay talking about it no um so we were headed out to we were in Panjaway in Afghanistan um heading out to the village of Lock and I and we'd only been in country like a month and so very kind of country-ish um you know we got our mat v's and our and our mraps but you know being on foot it's like hey we don't have that overwhelming force of fire but we had some side-by-sides that you know one had a, a mark 44 and the other one had you know like a minigun and stuff on it and so you know as we're doing our planning um because the team before us didn't really try to broach that much to the east because it was very controlled and obviously, like, we're going to come in and be like, you know, screw that. We're right. going to go out there and, you know, kick ass. So um, during the planning, you know, part of my decision was like, hey, you know, let's let's take the ATVs so we have, you know, more overwhelming force fire. Because we don't, we don't carry saws or, you know, 240s or anything like that. Everybody's pretty much just walking, you know, 10 and a half inch uppers on M4s hmm. plus whatever your partner force has and then your, your EOD guys. Um, and so that worked that way we could also use them as Kazavac vehicles to, to get out if we needed to. Okay. Um, so we're patrolling um, along a village wall. Um, EOD, CMRG is up there doing their thing. A couple of dudes from the team and some counterparts are walking ahead. And then, you know, next thing I know, like I'm driving the ATV, my buddy Rich is in the passenger seat. And then Cody's on the back on the minigun standing up. And uh, next thing I know, I'm like 30 feet in a ditch. Um, from the, the right elbow down, pretty much looks like hamburger meat. Yeah. And then that's pretty much all I remember. Um, and so I kind of came in and out um, in Germany. Don't really remember anything else from Afghanistan. Wow. Um, and then I, I pretty much woke up in Texas. Um, Sans a right arm and a, and a right leg from uh the knee up so but it is what it is it's a job hazard you know what i mean we signed up for it so i can't i can't be mad um you know i, I made the decision to do that um cody's still alive he's got a little bit of brain injury like he's there he just he can't talk okay. but he's completely like functional it's just he had a little bit of brain damage rich didn't make it so you know those are decisions that you know we, we live with as an adult that we have to, you know, it is, a, it's the job. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know, like you, you've been able to reconcile it, but it's one of those things where I don't know about you guys, but in our community, like people don't really talk about what could happen. You just kind of deal with it when it happens. I mean, and obviously like a lot of like what we did in our jobs is depends on like physicality and like that physicality gives you this huge sense of confidence in yourself and your teammates. And that can be taken away in a moment, like I, I, you know, the times that like my mind did wander, I would think like, well, it's kind of like easy to die because you just die and yeah. that's it. But I would always wonder like, what if I, what if I lived and like, I couldn't do the things that I enjoyed if I lost that sense of physicality, which, you know, even like life after the military, like, yeah, it's one thing to be able to do your job, but you want to be able to do the things that you enjoy doing before that, which typically were pretty physical, outdoorsy, you know, active stuff. I mean, like, was there, was there a morning period where you were like, wow, like this, this really sucks. Or did your mind just go to like, well, my next mission is I've got to figure out like what's going to give me a sense of purpose, fulfillment. Like, how am I going to 
overcome this? Cause I know that obviously you, you like people in that community, like they have that in them, like they can flip a switch and say, well, this is just one more thing that I've got to deal with, but you're also a human being. And it's totally reasonable to be like, to, re to frankly, just feel sorry for yourself for at least a little bit. Like what was that kind of mental process like for you? Um, like in the hospital, like for like a week or so, I was kind of like that because it's like, you, you don't know, like, okay, I, I worked for this to, to get here. Like, I don't know, like, what am I supposed to do now? Like, cause you don't, you don't know anything. Like you don't, you know what I mean? Like you don't, you don't know about retirement, you know, you don't know what you get. You don't know benefits or anything like that. Um, where like you were talking about vice versa. Like I never thought about being an amputee. It was either like, I came home like completely fine or dead. You know right. what I mean? It was like, totally. no in between. Yep. Um, so like now I'm in this middle ground, like this gray area and I'm like, well, shit. So there was that little bit of that dark time for like a week or so, like I said, and it was like, okay, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And then I think I ended up seeing two. I didn't know anything about prosthetics and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to have a wooden leg right. and a claw for a hand or something. Yeah. Like I have no idea because you don't know about that stuff. So I think I saw like an, an amputee doing something like online, you know, doing research. And I'm like, okay, well this dude's missing an arm and a leg. And it took him like five years to, to run this race, like a tough mutter. And I'm like, yeah. fuck it, man. I can do it in one. <laughs> right. Yeah. So like, then it just went to like, okay, well, I knew how to lift before. How do I lift now? Like, how do I train now? And so then it just went into how, how can I do this and how can I get better? So then it's going like, you know, to PT and then being like, okay, this is what you want. And I'm going to do this, but can I do this also? Like, this is my goal. And so my PT was named Fred. He was like an old retired Lieutenant Colonel. He was super cool. And he was like, yeah, we can do that. So, and it just started from there, like figuring out ways to train um, and then broadening my knowledge on more stuff and then just tackling goals, like race after race. And then I did, I've done all kinds of stupid stuff, man. That's incredible. And, and you ended up, you rehabbed a, a CFI Center for the Intrepid, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Can you talk about that? Cause like, that's a pretty like magical place. So, um, at the time, what was my doctor's name? Oh, I can't remember. He was such an awesome dude. He was also my, he was my surgeon, but he was also in charge. Like super okay. great dude, super friendly. Like everybody there was really nice. Like it just when, like I was, I spent, I spent a year there. Um, could, would have been a little bit shorter, but we had a hard time. Um, I had some, uh, like heterotopic ossification issues. Yeah. Um, so I had, like, I had my initial, my last surgery, I had like 30 surgeries. So then finally, like, you know, 30, three zero. My, 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 yeah. A bunch of blood transfusions rolled around my sweet electric wheelchair, like a boss with my beard, my dingy homeless looking hair. Um, so rehab started, um, cause I had a bunch of like kind of damage to my left leg to like my knee which is fine. It just looks really gross. Um, so it really started trying to get back that range of motion and then kind of learn how to like transfer. Cause like when you, you know, you're used to ever doing everything with, you know, four limbs trying to move around on one and like, you'd be surprised how well you don't balance when you, when you don't realize when you, I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm sure it would be very hard. Like I'm a, like we're demonstrating for kids on jumps, like single leg hops or like pogos or like double contact single leg. I'm, I'm amazing because it's like all I do all day. I've seen those focus. videos, man. I'm like, I'm like, damn. I'm like, yeah, let me just let me just show you anyway. But um, so it was like a slow rehab process at first, but like I would do what they wanted and then I would kind of push myself. So the rehab, I would go for like a couple hours a day, um, three days a week. And then if I wasn't doing that, it was pretty much like I had to keep getting testing done to make sure I didn't have like TBIs and stuff like that right um and then it was really just recovery so group was really good like they they paid for an apartment um so for me to stay in so my wife and kid were there with me okay. so basically it was just like pt eating like i slept a ton so my body could heal and then watching every livable thing like everything i could find on netflix like even with subtitles okay so that was pretty much the whole year process though so did that um, I had to have a surgery again. And like, so I started in January of 2014 
I had to have surgery again in May because I had some extra bone growth going on. Um, got that done and then got fitted for prosthetics. So okay. started learning to walk, which was like a very emotional experience. Like you wouldn't think it would be, even though you're rocking with a robot leg, but it really is. Um, Cause you're not having to sit down anymore, which is so awesome. So then from there it was like, all right, I can walk. All right, you still fall over and eat crap a bunch of times. And then it's like, all right, where's the one that I can run with? All right, so like here's a running blade. And then it just, it started going from there. Um, I got an upper body limb. It's just really weird. Cause like your whole proprioception with it, it's like out in space, man. You just knock stuff over. You look like the crazy windmill dudes at car, like car dealerships at blow. That's what it looks like with a prosthetic arm. So I don't wear that. Plus I'm already left-handed, so I'm yeah. good. Was your, was your leg uh, above or below the knee amputation? So initially, um, like it was pretty much like 90 degrees, like mid shin. Okay. Um, so it was below the knee, Okay. but apparently somebody's terrible at wound debridements. So when they took the dressing off, like there was a bunch of like fungus and stuff. So they had to keep cutting higher, you know, instead of just, you know, initially cutting higher to save with. Okay. We won't go into that. Right. But you know what I mean? So could have had a knee joint or at least been like a, a knee disc or tick, which would have been nice. So it's not, you know, sitting on my butt. And how did you find the environment there in terms of just like being around other people with similar injuries? Like, was that helpful? Was that like a support network? Um, it was pretty good. There was actually a decent amount of um, soft dudes there. Yeah. So we would get together like during training sessions, you know, and like, you know, talk, be like, oh yeah, that's cool. You do this. Well, I do this. But then like right. the training atmosphere it's like, okay, well, you're doing that. Like everybody's an A-type, right? In the soft sure. mentality. So it's like, okay, you're doing that. Like, cool, I'm with you. You know what I mean? We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Um, didn't really re interact with like the, I, I would interact with the regular army guys, but their level of commitment of trying to get better quick to get out and get back wasn't as high as like the, the SF guys. Like right. the SF guys were like, like I even had the, the grand dream of like, okay, cool. I'm missing an arm and a leg. Like I will find a way to get back to a team, like whatever yeah. it takes, you know what I mean? So just the mentality was different and that's not knocking the regular army guys. It's just sure. Off dudes are there for a reason and yeah. that's the way it is. I mean, one thing, you know, cause like the job in pararescue and in soft medicine is a little bit more reactionary. Like you're trying to respond to a bad thing and basically keep people alive so they can get to the surgeons, they can get to the center for the intrepid. And it's, you know, a lot of times, like you don't have a lot of follow-up with the people that you treated at the point of injury or in the field. And so it's very easy to get, to get cynical. Cause like, you're like, well, this person, you know, like you don't know where they're going to end up. Like you don't see that like someone like you, like you run your own business, you've got this career strength and conditioning coach. And you basically created a whole new life for yourself. Like, what would you say to maybe the, like the, the soft medics, who are doing like the, the point of injury care, maybe don't have a lot of follow-up after the fact, like just to, to give them a better perspective on like what, what difference they make and, and that kind of thing. Cause like I said, it can be easy to get cynical when like every night you're picking up people who are injured, missing limbs. And it, I, I don't know, like you're obviously you're always going to be professional and, and do your job and you don't think about like what happens after that. But, you know, just, I think like talking to you actually makes me feel a lot better about the work that, that I did and my, my teammates did because it's very easy to get to get jaded in that environment. Dude, I you guys are like pretty much the most amazing like medics, right? And I I don't mean to like dumb it down to that, but you guys are 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 awesome. Like the the ability and the skills that you guys have, whether it's just like from basic stuff to like advanced stuff type injuries, and I'm talking like like Rich for example, who died, right? Like Lunchbox was our medic. We call him Lunchbox because he ate a lot and he's a big dude, right? And uh, Brett, who was like this six foot five giant from like Nebraska, whose brother like played for Nebraska football. Like he knew he was the smallest one. Like the, the skill, like Rich was pretty much severed in half. And like your guys' skill set, that dude, and it wouldn't be a way to live. I'm not, you know, saying that he was alive when he got on the bird, yeah. right? And he, and he probably wouldn't have made it anyway, but the ability that you guys have 
with such traumatic injuries to, to keep dudes alive in flight, you know, back to calf or, or bath or wherever, you know, in Iraq, Baghdad, whatever it may be. It's immeasurable. Like there, we wouldn't, it wouldn't work without you guys. I mean, it's super honest. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of people, I mean, like who just, you know, because of the experiences they have, the things that they saw, like it, it stays with them for the rest of their lives. And I, I kind of wish there was some kind of a program where people could see the, like the impact that like the initial care they provided has on people's lives long-term. I think that it would help to, you know, because obviously like everyone's got kind of things they deal with. Um, what, what somebody might do is like, you know, more of like a, in a direct action role is different psychologically than what you deal with as a, a medic or as a first responder. But I wish there was more follow-up because I think that it would help actually both sides heal a lot more psychologically. Like even this conversation, I mean, not to, not to like get weird, but the guy, guys like you are what makes me so proud to have served in the military because just like, like after everything that you've been through, like the outlook that you have on life. And it's like, it, it, it upholds the standard of like, wow, like you, you've got to like, you've got to bring it in the soft community because there are guys like you, even if you can't continue doing the job, like you've created a whole new, new life for yourself. And I, I think these conversations are very, very cathartic. And I wish that, I wish there was like some kind of a formalized program where the military facilitated these kind of conversations, because I think, you know, you're dealing with different things than maybe the first responder is. And, and you've got to like, you have physical things that you've got to deal with the rest of your life, but it's hard to differentiate the physical stuff from the psychological stuff. And, um, you know, I, I just wish more of these conversations took place. I think, yeah, I think you're right from a mental aspect, like I said, a closure would be good. You know, like, what am I, am I, am, is what I'm doing, making a difference. And you know right. what it is at the time, but like the after effects, like, hey man, like, even if you know, like, it could be like a severe leg wound, like, hey man, did I do a good enough job? Like, did he keep it? You know what I mean? Like, whatever, you know, I mean, I understand what you're totally saying. Yeah, it's because without seeing the, the after effects of, of the care that you provide, it's just, it's very easy, like I said, to, to be cynical. Cause you're like, you almost think like, well, like what, what difference am I really making? And it's not it's not like your job as a medic or a first responder to like, to, to figure out what, what's going to make someone's life meaningful after you provide that like point of injury care. But I think seeing like the lives that people create for themselves, you know, after they have these injuries and that they, they can find meaning and fulfillment. It's, I, I think it's, it's, it just provides that much more motivation for guys to keep putting their neck out there and doing these, these rescues and the point of injury care. Cause I mean, obviously things have slowed down a little bit, but like there was a time when, you know, people were going out every night and seeing some horrible things over and over. And, you know, um, there's no matter what, I think they're, they're always going to like carry that with them, but seeing the difference that their care makes long-term, I think could, could bring a lot of people together. So, I mean, not to like make things too sort of depressing and morbid, but um, these conversations are really, really helpful, I think on both sides. So you have this injury and obviously like you, you're, you're, mental framework change from like, wow, kind of, this is pretty horrible. to like, well, how do I, how do I do a Spartan race? You know, how do I create this new kind of, albeit with some constraints, this new type of athletic and physical life for myself? How did um, the career in strength and conditioning come to be after all these injuries? Um, so, you know, I, after doing the races, it kind of went to, okay, I've done this. Like, what else can I do? <clears throat> and then it went to, cool, man, I'm going to do a men's physique competition <laughs> against normal body dudes and beat them and see what happens. So I started training for that and uh, ended up doing one. Uh, was it like 2016, 2017? Might've been 2016. So against like eight other dudes, nine other dudes. And I think I took like third in one category and like fifth out of 12th in another. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I can do this which doesn't mean anything by any means. So, but I, I fell in love with training more and then finding ways to adapt um, to my situation. So then it led to volunteering um, with an organization that's like local here that brings children with uh, like amputations, whether, you know, <clears throat> be a like trauma or, you know, congenital and then getting them to be involved in sports and, and working out. So I started to lead the workout piece for that. And then it just was like, okay, I can do this. And I was like, 
okay, if I can do this, like I can start working with athletes. And then obviously there's always, you know, some stigma of, okay, well, like, how are you going to teach my kid to squat, bro, when you can't even squat? You know what I mean? Like, I'm a pretty good teacher, but anyway, but so that led into that. And it, like when we were moving back home, I didn't enjoy being retired anymore because all I did was like watch TV. I, I, you know, I still worked out and did stuff with my family. But I think at one point I hadn't went outside. Like I worked out in Florida when we still live in Florida. I hadn't been in town in like two months. Oh, wow. Cause there was like no reason to go anywhere. Like I was just working out doing stuff. Like we weren't, we were super busy. So we didn't have time to go anywhere. And I was like, this is not, this is not good for me. You know what I mean? It's not good from like a mental health standpoint. Like I'm not interacting with people. Right. Um, Cause like I said, the stigma is still there. Like, even though I go out and do stuff, like I still perceive, you know, people are like, Oh, look at this dude. You know what I mean? He's missing stuff. Cause you don't see too many dudes walking around missing the right side of their body. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I want to open a gym. Like I want to, I want to bring something that doesn't exist to where we're going because everything's either like your mom and pop type fitness shop, you know, where it's like, and nothing against older folks being fit, but people just walking on treadmills and doing stuff. Like I wanted to create a gym that like went back to like the way it used to be, you know, like when you were training, you know, at your compound, that was like, you come here to train. Yeah. And so it just started out being like an awesome facility, you know, that actually had turf, you know, nice equipment that wasn't like refurbished stuff. It was, it was new stuff. Dudes could come in here or women and work out. And then it evolved into a couple athletes, like doing some stuff at the house for me. And I'm like, I'll start training you. And then it just, those two, I, I, I trained for free. And then it just started going, they told their friends and then it just, it went on and it went on from there. Yeah. It's crazy how that works. And so did you have any, um, any mentors in strength and conditioning? Like, how did you, were you self-educated? And then it's one thing to learn the, the coaching side of things and, you know, programming and exercise selection and that kind of stuff. But then on top of that, you like, you weren't just a coach, you ran your own business and opened up a facility. So how the hell did you learn how to do, <laughs> how to do that between like, you're learning a whole new profession, getting that skill set, And then you've got to like, learn how to run the business. Like, where did you, how did you piece all this stuff together? Um, the business standpoint, like our, our banker, like our banker is a really good friend. So like he gave us a whole bunch of like business tidbits okay. on like how we should, like, this is how we should do stuff, <clears throat> you know, set us up with like a good accountant, like, Hey, this is what you should be tracking. This is how you should be doing this. So that really helped out. Like in reality, like I run everything on the floor and my wife runs everything behind the door, like behind the door. Like it's a good setup. <laughs> I couldn't literally tell you like what bills we pay for the gym. And that's probably terrible, but she does all that. She does all the, you don't, you don't want to know. You don't want to know. <laughs> I, pro I probably don't want to know. Probably why I don't get a paycheck. Um, so she, she handles the business side of stuff. Um, so, but the strength and conditioning side, it was kind of like, you know, I did my own research and then it'd be like, Okay, I didn't understand stuff. So like I would message people like Joe Ken, who was yeah, like, yeah. you know what I mean, the strength and conditioning coach for the Panthers and stuff like that. And like he would literally, you know, he would write back like the same day. And I'm like, Really? Holy shit. You know, like a big name dude that's, you know, working with guys in the NFL. So like I would ask him questions or, you know, when it came to like, all right, I got a majority of like baseball, softball kids. Like, I need to expand my knowledge. Like, okay, all right. Who, who do I know? Like, okay, well, Zach does a really good job at TCU. Yeah. All right, let me shoot him messages. And then I, I found out, you know, like on Twitter, like, you know, if you're just nice and you approach people yeah. and, and ask them and you can obviously be like, I'll always be like, Hey, I'll, I'll pay for your time, you know, to, to chat with you. But if you're just nice about it and upfront, most people will, will help you out. You know, as long as you're not asking for like eight hours a day, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can, you can kind of learn and expand upon what you know which is nice. Yeah, that's really cool. And I mean, it's easy to get cynical on Twitter because you see the stupid stuff that strength coaches are arguing about. But oh, yeah. behind the scenes, if you've got guys like Joe Ken and Zach, you know, like being that responsive to an up and coming coach, like there's a lot of 
a lot of good people who want to help. And yeah. I, I think it's important that like, that, yeah, we, we emphasize that. Like there's so many good people in this profession who just pay it forward. Just like, you know, just, they got the mentorship earlier on. They just, just keep passing it down from generation to generation. And uh, that, that's really cool to see. That I agree. Can, Cause I mean, you, I know you see it all the time, guys, guys complaining about money and stuff like that. But then if people write and ask you for help and you're not helping, then we're not increasing the quality of what's being put out there. So then you can't justify you wanting more money if there's, you know what I'm, it's just a long lengthy thing. Yeah. There's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And it could be just like the background you came from where like no mission is impossible. But I mean, when you really think about it, like to start a new profession, it would be one thing if you like, you worked for a high school team, a college team, whatever, but then to open up your own gym, like it actually, it is kind of crazy, but right. Like anything probably after everything that you went through and all the training you had, you're like, this is just one more thing that I'm going to overcome. And I don't, I mean, I, I fail probably a lot more than I do good by all means. I mean, if you, if you, I, you can't, I can't remember who said it, but if you're not growing, then you're dying. You got to be like, right. a tree. and I can't remember who that was. I feel bad for not remembering, but you know what I mean? Like I, there are kids that I've failed because you know, either they end up cheating reps and, you know, like we had a talk or whatever, or they didn't show up. And like, I, as a private business owner, like sometimes I got to do the right thing for like the business. And like, I got, you know what I mean? I got to let them go. Like, I don't, hmm. not in their fault, but I don't want to be that person. That's like, Oh, well, you're not coming. I'm going to keep taking your money. Cause it's not your money. Your parents are paying for it. Right. And I, and I want to put out a good quality product and I'll, and I always do my best to try to make sure kids are doing good, you know, whether they're good at home or school and stuff like that. But like, sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes I, I fail in that regard and they just, you know, they slip away. So. So like, ultimately, what do you envision your gym becoming? Like, What's your ideal scenario? If your, if your career and your gym takes off the way that you want it to, have you thought about that? Um, no, I, I try to really keep it low key. Like you see, I post some stuff from time to time. Um, but I don't really post as much as I should. I probably should more. Um, I, I don't, there are times that I, I am one of those people that I'm like, I don't make enough money. Like I literally charge, I think for three days a month, like $165, okay. which is like not a lot. Right. But it's like I said, though, it's where I'm at. You can't get away with like something like in Massachusetts where it's like two days a week for the month is like $500. Like you, you can't get away with it here. So you turn that off for me, dude. Fine, yeah. Sorry. He's playing MLB the show. Sorry. Um, so obviously eventually I'd like to get some people in. Like I have one of my high school kids that comes in and helps um, right now before he leaves to, to go do his national guard stuff over the summer. Um, like at 17, that kid got a basic certification and like comes in and like interns with me. Cause he wants, he's going to play football in Iowa um at simpson college and he wants to go and follow on get his master's degree and become a strength and conditioning coach for a team which is awesome so hopefully i get somebody in here that can like basically take over and i can get a little bit more free time or you know my my we're about to have a new baby but my oldest you know if he ends up going like he's 11 now if he ends up going d1 i'll say like i did my part and then i'll retire again um right. so i'll just be like see what i did was actually perfect and it worked but he could just be really good at baseball, which he kind of is, but so who knows? And then personally, do you still have like that, uh, the adventure race bug? From time to time, like, I'm kind of like, eh, I want to do something, but now it's like, I'm more of like a learning aspect. And then more of, I want to just spend more time with my family and like yeah. more time with them. Cause like for the, these past couple of years, it's been like pretty much me and like my little, my intern, and so like, I, I'll, I would be here, like, really, I'm really here early and I'm here late and I kind of want to cut that down as sure. much as I can. Yeah. So, which also comes back to the point, like if I do have kids that don't perform and it's just because they're really, really lazy and I've tried talking to them, like there's better things I could be doing like with my family. And I'm not trying to be negative when I say that, but like, totally. if we've had yeah, the talk no. and we've been invested in, like, I don't want to waste your parents' time and their money if you don't want it. So yeah, you got someone that doesn't want to be there and it's coming at the expense of you spending time with your own kids. It's your life. Yeah. 
So, yeah. and, and most parents are pretty cool with that. Like when baseball has started now, um, like I'll rearrange kids to be like, Hey, my kid has practice or my kid has games during the week. Like I, I want to be there. So most parents here are pretty cool about that. So we can rearrange and work around schedules. So, and well, I don't, I, and yeah. I don't work weekends anymore, which is awesome. Yeah. God. Well, um, I know that you, I think you've got some, some games of, you know, to, of your kids to potentially be watching. So I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Where can people learn more about, you know, your, your gym, your social media, and just, you know, get in touch with you. Um, on Facebook, you can reach out. Um, we have a page. It's called Foundry Athletics. On Instagram, I'm pretty sure I'm just Jared Bullock 12 or not Instagram, Twitter. Instagram is Foundry Athletics. I don't have a, a Instagram account anymore. I got rid of that. That was too tiring. Okay. I had like way too many people on there. Um, but yeah, you can get on there. You can reach out. You can ask me anything. I'm an open book. So. All right. Well, yeah, I appreciate your time. And I, I would encourage people because you're putting out some great content and like how I even discovered you, like I mentioned before we recorded, had nothing to do with your, your military background. I just saw like your athletes doing some really good, just basic stuff and do, almost like the whole SF thing, just like flawless in the fundamentals. And that's what gets me excited, even though maybe it doesn't get other people excited on social media. So just, I mean, obviously really interesting military personal background, but you're putting out some great content as a coach. And I would encourage people to, to check out what you're doing over there. Well, thank you. All right. Well, yeah. Take care and uh, talk soon. All right, buddy. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Resilient Performance Podcast. As a thank you for listening, please use promo code podcast for 10% off our professional development resources at resilientperformance.com. Also, make sure to sign up for our mailing list to receive exclusive content and promotions.